literary criticism. Uh, I am Dr. Fuzi Slisli, and we will be talking today about Latin criticism. Um, we will look at some of the most important Roman Latin uh, theorists, people who wrote and talked about literature and poetry and style and uh, left some of uh, the ideas that have been extremely important in shaping European tastes and European arts later on. So today we will talk about these theorists. Mostly <coughs> we will look at the work of three Roman writers, uh, Horace, Quintilian, and Seneca. First of all, I would like to make a distinction between the Greek and the Roman culture. Homer's poetry in ancient Greece was not a book <clears throat> that readers read. Homer didn't circulate as a book. Uh, it was an oral culture that people sung in the street and in the marketplace, in weddings and funerals, in war and in peace. The uh, Greek tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides were not plays that people read in books either. They were performances and shows that people attended at the tragic festivals every year. Um, in that sense, uh, Greek culture was a living culture that sprung from people's everyday life. All the Greeks old and young, aristocrats and commoners, literate and illiterate, can be found to, part to have participated in producing and in consuming this culture. The situation in Rome, in ancient Rome, is different. The Greek culture in Rome became books that had no connection to everyday life and to average people anymore. Only the elite in Rome could pick up these books from the libraries, that's where they live now. It's, it's a culture of books that lives in libraries and only a certain small number of elites can go pick it up from the library and read it and interact with it. Greek books were also um, written down in a language, Greek, that most of the Romans didn't speak. And the Greek books also belonged to a culture, to an era that was uh, in the past and uh, it was a past that the Romans didn't have much knowledge of. I mean they knew it was in the past but they didn't know how far back in the past it was. Only a small educated minority of Romans had the ability to interact with these books. <clears throat> Generally it was a dead culture it belonged to the past, it was remote, and with no connection to the daily existence of the majority of the Roman population. In Rome, Greek culture was not a living culture anymore. It was a museum culture. Uh, some aristocrats used it to show off, but it did not inspire the present. Roman literature and criticism emerges as an attempt to imitate this uh, Greek culture that now lives in books, that's preserved in books. Roman literature and criticism develops as an attempt to revive this Greek culture and imitate it in Latin, the Romans' language. The Romans did not engage the culture of Greece to make it inform and, 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 and inspire their present. They wanted to reproduce the books. They wanted to have sections in the libraries, in the museum, with their own names to sit next to the Greek books. Um, and the distinction, um, living culture and monument culture or museum culture, a living culture in Greece, we had a living culture. In Rome, it becomes a monument or a museum culture. Uh, this is a distinction that I take from uh, Florence Dupont. Uh, it's a useful distinction that she makes in her book, The Invention of Literature. So um, let's look at some of these Roman theorists. First we will start with Horace uh, and his uh, famous poem called The Ars Poetica. It's so famous because 
uh, this long poem will have a huge impact on European literature and the development of European arts from the Renaissance all the way to the 20th century. So Horace's Ars Poetica was very influential in shaping Roman, in shaping European literary and artistic tastes. But Horace was not a philosopher like Plato or Aristotle. Um, he was just a poet and he wrote advice in the form of poems uh, to uh, the poets of his days, to Roman poets, with the hope of helping them improve the artistic effort of his contemporaries. But he wasn't like Plato or Aristotle. He didn't sit and analyze a complex cultural or historical situation like Plato or Aristotle does. He just writes advices to Roman poets. So in Ars Poetica, some of the advices he gives to Roman writers. He tells writers of plays that a comic subject should not be written in a tragic tone, and vice versa, a tragic subject should not, written, it should not be written in a comic tone. He advises them not to present anything excessively violent or monstrous on stage, and that he says also that the Deus Ex Machina, it's the machine that you know, the Greeks used for special effects, that the deus ex machina should not be used unless absolutely necessary. He also tells writers that a play should not be shorter or longer than five acts. And this is where the Europeans get this rule that became almost uh, a very strong rule. A play should not be longer or shorter than five acts and that the chorus should not sing between the acts anything which has no relevance or cohesion with the plot. So if they sing, if the chorus sings between the plot, it should be something that's connected to the plot. He advises further that poetry should teach and please should teach and please. This is also something that will become very important in European literature, that literature, the purpose of literature is to teach and please. And you can still find people, poets, writers today, who still believe in this principle that the purpose of literature is to teach and please. Many people, if you ask them to define what art is today, um, a very difficult question, and um, you know there aren't many people who can answer it, uh, because the, the, there is practically no answer to it. What is art? So a lot of people, if you ask them to define what is art, they will say it's something that teaches and pleases. And the source of this, of course, is Horace. And he also says that the poem should be conceived by the writer. The writer should conceive his poem as a form of static, static beauty, similar to a painting. Uh, the poet should look, should, should conceive or think of his poem like he's thinking of, 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 a, of a painting, a form of static, uh, uh, static painting, static beauty. And the phrase he uses is a phrase that becomes also very useful in European culture and history later on. It's ut pictoria poesis. Each one of these principles would become central in shaping European literary tastes. Um, also, very important uh, central idea in Horace's uh, criticism is the idea of sensibility, what he calls sensibility, which is simply I mean, another word for it is decorum. At the center of his ideas is the notion of sensibility. A poet, according to Horace, who has neither the ability nor the knowledge to keep the duly assigned functions and tones of poetry should not be hailed as a poet. This principle, basically, that sensibility is decorum, it's, it's the protocols. Poetry writing comes with a set of protocols. If the poet does not respect these protocols, he should not be called, he should not be respected, as a poet. This principle is announced in line 86 of the Ars Poetica, but it's assumed everywhere. The entire poem, uh, in a way, echoes this principle. Um, 
And whenever Horace talks about the laws of composition and style, about the rules of writing poetry, his model of excellence uh, that he wants the poets to imitate are the Greeks, of course. Um, <clears throat> the notion of decorum, the notion of decorum, uh, sensibility that he asks the writers to, to have is essentially a tool that allows him to separate what he calls sophisticated tastes which he associates with Greek books and with uh, aristocratic poetry and he separates it from what he calls the vulgar which he always associates with rustic and popular culture. He says, for example, in, his, in the Odes, his Odes 3.1.1, he says, I hate the profane crowd and keep it at a distance. Um, in the satires, uh, another collection of his poems, he says, uh, he talks about the college of flute players, quacks, beggars, mimics, actresses, parasites, and all their kinds. So, he describes the popular culture of his day as parasites and quacks and he opposes it to the official aristocratic written Greek inspired poetry that he wants his compatriots to try to write. Um, Horace's hatred, his hatred for the popular culture of his day is most apparent in his famous letter to Augustus. It's a famous letter that he wrote to the Emperor Augustus where he says Greece now captive took captive its wild conqueror meaning that Rome conquered Greece and as soon as that happened uh, Greece conquered Rome back with its culture of course Rome didn't have wasn't uh, didn't have books didn't have uh, writing didn't have sophisticated literature like Greece so um, when Rome conquered Greece, the culture of Greece started seeping into Rome, right? And in that way, the culture of Greece conquered Rome, right? So he says, Greece, now captive, took captive its wild conqueror and introduced the arts to rural Latium, to Rome where people speak Latin, that's Latium. So, because Rome conquered Greece, Greece sent its culture, introduced the, its culture to rural uh, uh, Rome and uh, captured it that way. It was Greece that conquered Rome culturally, but Rome conquered Greece militarily. And he says, the unprepossessing Saturnian rhythm, this is the common verse of early Roman poetry which Horace hates. He hates this, you know, local, popular, rustic uh, 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 tradition. He says the unprepossessing Saturnian rhythm went out and elegance drove off venom. So elegance comes from Greece in the form of uh, books of poetry and venom is his own Roman popular culture. Um, all the same, he says, traces of the country long remained and they are here today. It was late in the day that the Roman applied his intelligence to Greek literature. He began to inquire what use there might be in Sophocles and Thespis and Aeschylus. Essentially, saying that it was late, it was very late when the ignorant, rustic, uneducated Romans started being interested in this wonderful uh, written uh, Greek poetry that's in these beautiful books. And this elegance that's coming to us from Greece is helping us drive off, exterminate this popular venom that exists in his own day. It's very extreme. Uh, it's a very extreme condemnation of his own popular culture. And in his veneration of the uh, the book form poetry that comes from Greece, it's, it's also um, uh, a bit extreme because what Horace doesn't realize is that this Greek poetry that's now nicely preserved in books, 
used to be popular culture in Greece. Uh, the place of Sophocles uh, and Euripides did not circulate in books. And Homer, uh, his, his poems did not circulate in books. They were rustic, popular Greek culture. And it's only later on that they were written down and started circulating in books. But Horace doesn't, doesn't know that. He has this prejudice, this hatred for popular culture, and he seems to respect only culture that's nicely preserved in book format. Um, <clears throat> Horace <clears throat> uh, equates the, the preserved Greek culture, the books, the, the, the poetry books that come from Greece with elegance, and he equates the popular culture of his time with venom, poison. Um, this attitude that Horace has to his own popular culture was not unique to him. It was predominant in Rome among the educated people. Uh, poetry for Horace and his contemporaries meant written monuments. It wasn't a poetry that circulated in the streets among the people and helped people express their daily realities in these poems. Poetry for him were written monuments that are nicely preserved in books and they sit on a shelf in a library and the lucky guy whose name is on the book um, uh, becomes famous and his name is repeated for posterity afterwards. This is good poetry for Horace. It grants the poet fame and even a nationalistic sense of glory because, you know, he can say that, look, Horace, the Roman poet, did this for his country. He wrote a book of poems for his country. So as you, as you notice, uh, there is a dislocation. Horace doesn't see the culture of average people because there is a lot of poetry and poetic culture in uh, popular culture that Horace just doesn't accept and he only accepts and respects the culture of books. Um, uh, he says a point that explains this, he says, I will not die entirely. Some principal part of me yet evading the great goddess of burial. That great part of him, he says, I will not die complete me, completely. There will be a part of me that will evade death. And that part of him is his books, the books that he is leaving behind for posterity that will evade death. So you can see how Horace sees poetry. In ancient Greece, the poetic experience, poetry and philosophy and the culture of ancient Greece was a vibrant, popular and learned culture. It was a vibrant culture that helped people organize their present and, and, and deal with their daily life and their social issues and their political issues. It wasn't a question of, you know, recording one's name for posterity or... So you see how things are changing from Greece to Rome. Um, Horace's poetic practice was not rooted in everyday life as Greek poetry was. He read and reread the Iliad, he says, in search of what he says was, in search of what was bad, what was good, and what was useful, and what was not. This is his own words. Um, in his hatred, in the hatred he felt towards the popular culture of his day, the symptom, the seeds, were already clear of the rift, the division, between official and popular culture that would divide future European cultures. This is, it's on the basis of Horace's idea that European culture will, will, will have this strong division between official high culture and uh, popular, unofficial popular uh, culture. The duly, what he calls the duly assigned functions and tones of poetry that Horace spent his life trying to make poets respect were simply a mold for an artificial po poetry with really intolerant overtone, intolerant of the culture of average 
everyday people. Horace's ideas on poetry are based on an artificial distinction between a civilized text-based culture and a vulgar oral culture. It's a very artificial distinction that e today's scholarship doesn't accept this distinction uh, very much, at least not at face value. Um, and in all his writings, Horace urges the Ro Roman writers to imitate the Greeks and follow in their footsteps. In the Ars Poetica, he says, study Greek models night and day. And, and this is his legendary advice. The idea, the idea, though, has an underlying contradiction. Horace wants Roman authors to imitate the Greeks night and day and follow in their footsteps, but he does not want them to be mere imitators. How can you imitate but not be imitators? Uh, it's a contradiction not just in Horace, but in all the Roman writers, and even in European writers later. It's a contradiction that's never resolved. There is always this tension. This, 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 this tension. Uh, they want the writers to, be imi to imitate the Greeks, but they don't want them to be imitators. How do you create originality from imitation is uh, the big question, and it's not always solved. Horace's solution is only a set of metaphors with no practical steps. He says the common stock, meaning the Greek heritage, the common stock will become your private property, he's talking to the writer, if you don't linger on the broad and vulgar round, right? Just stay away from the broad and vulgar and the common stock, the Greek heritage, will become yours. What does it mean, become yours? It means you can take material from Greek poets and translate it into Latin, and pro you produce your own poems like it's your own. Um, so the, the common stock, the Greek heritage, will become your private property if you don't linger on the broad and vulgar round and anxiously render word for word. Just don't imitate or translate word for word a loyal interpreter or again in the process of imitation find yourself in a tight corner from which shame or the rule of the craft won't let you move. Ars Poetica 130-135 Horace's own poetry shows the same contradictions. In the epistle to Masena, he complains about the Slavish imitators. The Slavish imitators, they imitate slavishly. Those who ape the morals and manners of their betters, he says. He says, how oft you servile crew of mimics, when your bustling pranks have seen have you provoked my smiles? How often my spleen? You guys just make me smile or make me sleep, he says. He tells uh, the writers of his days that you are just, you just ape, you just slavishly imitate uh, your betters, meaning the Greeks. Um, in the presence, in the process of following and imitating the Greeks, Horace differentiates himself from those who mimic, right? Those who just imitate slavishly the Greeks. He says, I am different. Um, obviously, he doesn't have much esteem for this kind of imitation. And he saw his own practice as different. Um, he says in, in the epistle to Masenas, he says, I was the first to plant free footstep on a virgin soil. I walked not where others trod. Who trusts himself will lead and rule the swarm, meaning the crowd. I was the first to show to Latium the iambics of Paris, following the rhythm and spirit of Archilochus, not the themes or the words that hounded Lycambis. Him Never before sung by other lips, I, the lyricist of Latium, of Rome, have made known. It is my joy that I bring things untold before 
and I'm read by the eyes and held in the hands of the civilized. So, in imitating the Greeks, Horace claims originality. He, he says, I am original. I don't just imitate slavishly. But this bold claim that he makes, um, for example, he says, I walk uh, on, on a virgin soil. It, it, there is, it's contradictory. There is a contradiction implied. There is an implied detail there, and we all know it, that the soil on which he is walking was not virgin because the Greeks, Greek predecessors, had already walked on it. So he's not walking really on a virgin soil. He's just following in the footsteps of the Greeks, imitating the Greeks. In addition, as Thomas Green notes, the precise nature the, uh, of what Horace claims to have brought back from his walk on this soil is not clear. He says, I, I brought what others haven't heard before. It's not clear what he brought back. These were ideas in books that the Greeks had already talked about. However, Horace conceives of his imitation of the Greeks. He claims to be original, but he does a poor job at describing or articulating its dialectics. Imitation, for Horace, seems to have been a loose and imprecise metaphor in his vocabulary. Um, Horace also has another aspect of uh, stylistic criticism. And again, it has, he uses the metaphor of imitation, but this time it has to do with stylistic imitation. In the Ars Poetica, he advises aspirant poets to make his or her tale believable. He says, if you want me to cry, mourn first yourself, then your misfortune will hurt me. Um, essentially, he just he asks the writer to just be true to reality. If you want to represent something, make it f close to reality so that it becomes believable to people. My advice to the skilled imitator will be to keep his eye on the model of life and manners and draw his speech living from there. This is in the Ars Poetica. Whatever you invent for pleasure, he says, let it be near the truth. Um, in the Ars Poetica again. This use of imitation simply denotes a reality effect idea. Horace simply asks the writer to make the tale believable according to fairly common standards. His use of the term and the idea, the term of imitation and the idea of imitation, he uses them casually and in a conventional, fairly, you know, everyday, average uh, manner. If you depict a coward, Horace advises, make the depiction close to a real person who is a coward. Uh, but Horace is only thinking of a, of a stylistic idea. Uh, he doesn't, he can't think, for example, Horace can't conceive of poetry, all poetry, as an imitation of life, as, for example, Aristotle or Plato discuss it. For Aristotle and Plato, the idea of poetry or literature being an imitation or an imitation of life, Horace it doesn't seem to know this idea. Horace's ideas about imitating the Greeks and about poetry, imitating real-life models, were both imprecise, but they will become very influential in shaping European art and literature. The principles of taste, sensibility, or decorum that he insists on to distinguish between what he calls the civilized poetry from the uncivilized poetry will also be very instrumental in shaping the European distinction between official high culture and popular low one. Horace's ideas also helped form the perception of literature and poetry as national monuments and trophies. In uh, the Renaissance, when European writers will, you know, begin to imitate the Romans and the Greeks, the Europeans will also uh, 
conceive, they will think of poetry and poems as national monuments. So the French poet wants to write a poem for the glory of France, and in England it's for the glory of England, and so on. This is also something that didn't exist in Greece. The Greeks uh, pursued knowledge because they wanted to pursue the truth. They wanted, uh, Plato says, we follow the argument wherever it goes. It's for the, for the glory of the truth, not for the glory of Greece or my nation or your nation. So this is something, this nationalistic dimension to poetry uh, is something that the Romans put in place and it becomes very useful later on in European literature. Poetry in Horace's text, in Horace's poetry and, and criticism, poetry was subordinated to oratory, to rhetoric, right? And the perfection of self-expression, al-balaha, right? Al-fasaha. Homer and Sophocles and the Greek books are now taught in Rome, they teach them simply as examples of correct speaking uh, uh, for rhetoricians to practice with, which means that the ideas of the Greeks, it's, that's not that the Romans don't engage the ideas of the Greeks. They just want to use their stylistics, their books, to improve al-fasaha, the, the rhetoric, to improve their self-expression. And of course, this has a political dimension because in Rome, rhetoric, self-expression was very important to get important positions in the government, in politics, and so on. So the education in that sense was subordinated to politics. People got educated just to get a good political position. Again, this is something that didn't exist in ancient Greece because the Greeks pursued knowledge for its own sake, to improve themselves, to search for the truth, to explore issues with open mind wherever it goes, wherever it leads, whatever side it's on, whether it's on the side of, of Rome or France or England, it doesn't matter. Wherever the argument goes, Plato says, we just follow. Um, <clears throat> the idea of following the Greeks, the Greeks only magnified the temporal and cultural distance that the Romans had with the Greeks. I mean, in Rome, the Greek culture was uh, strange and foreign. It was from a foreign country, it was in a foreign language, and it was from a remote past, right? And the way the Romans imitated the Greeks only made that distance with the Greeks even bigger. It magnified it. So it, the Greek heritage became even more, uh, it became even more strange, even more incomprehensible. Uh, this is why we find frustration, for example, uh, amongst, uh, with Seneca and Cicero and others, like we saw in lecture number two, if you, you can go back to it. Um, Next, uh, I would like to talk about Quintilian uh, uh, and his famous book, The Institutio Oratoria, also one of the most uh, 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 famous Roman writers. He had a huge impact, not just on Roman culture, but on the European culture from the Renaissance to the 20th century. From 68 to 88 uh, AD, he was the leading teacher of rhetoric in Rome. He wrote the Institutio Oratoria as a help, uh, as a training manual for uh, rhetoricians, for orators. Sometimes Quintilian justifies the imitation of the Greeks. He says, and every technique in life is founded on our natural desire to do ourselves what we approve in others. Hence, children follow the shapes of letters, to attain facility in writing, musicians look for a model to the voice of their instructors, painters to, their, to the work of their predecessors, countrymen to methods of growing that have been proven successful by experience. Everybody learns by imitation. In fact, he says, we can see that rudiments, that the rudiments of any kind of skill are shaped in accordance with an example set for it. Uh, 
So everything grows, everything develops by finding a model first. So if we want to have a culture and uh, an education and system of knowledge, we should find the model, and that model, of course, are the Greeks. But he also turns around immediately and says imitation is dangerous. So he says, uh, yet this very principle which makes every accomplishment so much easier for us than it was for man who had nothing to follow is dangerous unless taken up cautiously and with judgment. So imitation is good, but it's also dangerous unless we are cautious and do it with like good judgment. It is the sign of a lazy mentality, he says, to be content with what has been discovered by others. If, you, if you're just happy with what the Greeks have done, then that's the sign of a lazy mentality. He also says, it is also shameful to be content merely to reach the level of your model, right? Uh, that's shameful. You should try to go further than the model. Um, in that sense, Quintilian advocates two positions on imitation. He says first that progress could be achieved only by those who refuse to follow. Uh, therefore, uh, imitation is undesirable. Uh, you shouldn't just follow, you should, you know, go alone. At the same time, Quintilian continues to advocate imitation and he goes on to elaborate a list of rules to guide writers to produce what he calls accurate imitations. The imitator, he said, should consider carefully whom to imitate and he should not limit himself to one model only. He should have a multiplicity of models. He should not violate the rules of genre and species of writing and should be attentive to his model's use of decorum, the same decorum that Horace talks about, uh, disposition and language. Um, the last person, the last author I want to talk about is Seneca. Um, he was a poet and a rhetorician. Seneca singles out. Seneca is slightly different and even slightly more interesting and more intelligent. He singles out a process, the process of transformation, that takes place when bees produce honey, right? When bees produce honey, they fly over many flowers and they cull, right? Juice out of those flowers. And from all that material they collect, they produce honey. He used this metaphor right, for the production of knowledge. And, and uh, he also used the image of uh, food. When food, after it is eaten, it turns into blood and tissue, right? So it, it's, the, the, it's in the same way he wants people to read the Greek material and uh, just like the bees fly over so many flowers, so you should read as many Greek writers as possible and from the material you gather it should transform inside and produce something new like the bee produces honey or like the food is transformed into our bodies and becomes blood and tissue. He explores the process of mellification, that's the process of the bee producing honey and he, produ he explores the chemistry of that process. Did it happen naturally? Is it natural for the bee to just, you know, cull material from flowers and then produce honey? Is that a, is that a natural process? Does the, bee, does the bee play an active role in it? Is it a process of fermentation? Um, he doesn't select any one uh, response or theory to explain the production of honey. He simply stresses the process of transformation. We also, I say, this is from his Epistula Morales, 84, 5 to 6. He says, we also ought to copy these bees and sift, sift whatever we have gathered from a varied course of reading, from whatever we're reading, for such things are better preserved if they are kept separate, the reading. Then by applying the supervising care, 
with such with which our nature has endowed us in other words our natural gifts we should so blend those several flavors into one delicious compound that even though it betrays its origin yet nevertheless is clearly a different thing from that whence it came right this is his metaphor how he applies the uh, idea of the bee producing honey on the process of imitating the Greeks and reproducing their culture. He says this is what we see nature doing in our own bodies without any labor on our part. Our bodies do it without even us intervening. The food we have eaten as long as it retains its original quality and floats in our stomachs as an undiluted mass is a burden. The food that we eat, if it stays in its original format and the stomach doesn't process it, it, it remains an undiluted mass and it becomes a burden. It creates all sorts of problems for the stomach. But it passes, this food, it passes into tissue and blood only when it has been changed from its original form, right? So the process of changing the material, the food should change, be processed by the stomach. The same thing, he wants to say that the same thing happened for the ideas, the material we gather in our reading from the Greeks. If it stays as an undiluted mass in the head, in our brains, it's a burden. But if it's transformed in the brain, just like the stomach transforms the food, if it's transformed in the head, in the brains, then it produces something new and original. He says, so it is with the food which nourishes our higher nature, meaning the brain. We should see to it that whatever we have absorbed should not be allowed to remain unchanged or it will not be part of us, right? It will just stay there as a mass. We must digest it. Otherwise, it will merely enter the memory and not the reasoning power. Uh, again, this is Epistula Morales, 84, 6 to 7. Um, to conclude what we've been saying about these Latin, Roman Latin authors, uh, Latin authors never discuss poetry or literature as an imitation in general, like Plato or Aristotle does. They only discuss them they only discuss poetry as an imitation of the Greeks, right? They don't discuss poetry as an imitation of life, as an imitation of reality. Latin authors are not familiar with Plato's and Aristotle's analysis of poetry. Uh, Aristotle's The Poetics and Plato's Book 3 and Book 10 of the Republic do not seem to have been available for the Romans. Uh, in their introduction uh, to their book, Classical and Medieval Literary Criticism, uh, critics Preminger, Hardison and Corain say that, unfortunately, Aristotle's poetics exerted no observable influence in the classical period. It appears likely that the treatise was unavailable to subsequent critics. Latin authors used poetry and literature for two things only. First, to improve eloquence, right? And second, to sing the national glories of Rome and to show off culture. This conception of literature will remain prevalent in Europe until the mid-20th centuries, uh, as future lectures will show. And this brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope it has been useful. Shukran jazeelan wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.